This recording is the second part on the thyroid gland, where we're going to address the regulation of thyroid hormone uh, secretion, the mode of action of thyroid hormones, and the physiologic effects of thyroid hormones. Now, the thyroid hormones T3 and T4 are subject to regulation via hormonal stimuli. Because T3 and T4, the synthesis of those are regulated by the anterior pituitary hormone TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. You will not be able to make T3 or T4 without TSH. TSH regulates the uptake of iodine. It regulates all the enzymes involved in thyroid hormone synthesis. Another thing to, 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 to put down is TSH also stimulates growth of the thyroid gland because it's referred to as a trophic hormone. So that would be important when we look at the effects of someone that has um, over secretion of TSH, they're going to have hyperthyroidism, but they're also going to have an enlarged thyroid gland, which is referred to as a goiter. Now, TSH is regulated by the hypothalamic hormone, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. So we refer to this collectively as a hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. Now, the T3 and T4 is subject to you know, classic negative feedback regulation. So if T3 and T4 levels increase in the blood, what's going to eventually going to happen is you're going to the, it's going to come back and inhibit the TRH as well. It can also inhibit TSH secretion. So we try to keep T3 and T4 um, in certain levels in the blood. One of the things, just to give you examples, what stimulates the release of TRH from the hypothalamus is cold. Being really cold will stimulate that because T3 and T4 is going to have thermogenic effects. So we'll see that very quickly. So this is your standard regulation of T3 and T4. So if T3 and T4 is high, you should have T TRH and TSH being low because we kind of want to keep everything in a narrow range. Now, the mode of action of thyroid hormones, being the fact that they are lipophilic, is they can easily diffuse across plasma membranes. Their recept receptors um, are located, we have receptors for them within the mitochondria, plus also within the nucleus. Now, the mitochondrial effects, we're going to see it's, its effects on metabolism, effects on ATP production, but its effects binding, the receptor binding to um, thyroid hormones in the nucleus are going to have effects on gene transcription, which ultimately will affect translation and protein synthesis, in that it could either increase or decrease protein synthesis, depending on um, what we're talking about but it changes the activity of the cell and you ultimately have a response. So the effects of thyroid hormones take a little bit of time. Anything that affects gene transcription is not immediate, but once it takes effect, the effects tend to be longer lasting. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all the different effects of thyroid hormones. Now, one of the things to kind of keep in mind is that thyroid hormones have multiple target, pretty much, targets virtually every cell in your body, so it has multitude of effects on the body. So you kind of see a lot of different things that, that, that it affects, but one thing I want you to notice is T4 had to be converted to T3. So, and it, this is actually wrong, it's not an iodinase. You had to deiodinate, it's a deiodinase, convert T4 to T3. So T4, trans is transported across the plasma membrane. It will be converted to T3. T3 then binds to receptor in the nucleus. It affects trans um, transcription. Okay, so and then eventually you make new proteins. So you notice all the different effects. So we're going to go through these, the ones that are, you know, the more important ones. So we're going to go through these step by step. So big thing is affects your metabolism. So mitochondria, you know, I noticed that the re there was a receptor for T3 in the mitochondria. Is it actually, one of the things it does, it, it increases the number and the activity of mitochondria. And mitochondria are the responsible for ATP synthesis. So it increases that. 
and the thing is to make ATP you have to consume oxygen so oxygen consumption goes up overall your basal metabolic rate that's your BMR will increase another thing is it increases the sodium potassium ATPase a large amount of your energy in your body is actually utilized for the sodium potassium pump now so it tends to overall increase metabolism and technically this is kind of people thinks it's kind of odd is it technically makes you like less efficient is when you were needing to produce the ATP you have a certain amount of fuel that you use to make ATP but you're making less ATP than you normally should so it's like but you still need to produce ATP so you need to break down more and more fuel to get energy and so once you think about that is people that are hyperthyroid is they're always having to break down fuel and they're going to be losing weight because they're constantly trying to make ATP and also one of the things that you'll notice is people who are hyperthyroid are going to complain about being hot because the thyroid hormones have a thermogenic effect it thermogenic has to be do with heat so not all the energy that you get from the breakdown of fuels like fat and carbohydrates is results in ATP production a lot of that energy is going to be lost as heat so with this one because it actually it increases. I'll write this down it increases uncoupling proteins these are the ones that make it where you're producing less ATP from that fuel and so when you do that though the energy is going to be lost as heat because energy cannot be created nor destroyed it just changes form so in this case you're just going to have a lot more heat production so overall increase in metabolism and all pretty much all cells in your body now, the thing is what's the fuel so you have to have fuel to break down to make energy so it's going to affect carbohydrate fat and protein metabolism so let's look at the effects on fat so in with fat it increases the breakdown of fat which is lipolysis so when you do that is you're going to increase the number of free fatty acids because the fats are triglycerides which is three fatty acids in the glycerol so the fatty acids are going to increase and we're going to increase their oxidation because that's going to be used to make energy okay so overall lipid metabolism you're going to break down fat increase the level of free fatty acids we're going to use that for energy by increasing fatty acid oxidation carbohydrate metabolism we're going to use glucose so glucose transport is going to be affected is it increases glucose transport into cells so we can use it for energy but we're also going to need the glucose so it stimulates gluconeogenesis and it stimulates the breakdown of glycogen so we kind of see a common theme it kind of increases 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 a lot of stuff so we're going to be able to get glucose available and then transport it in the cell and hopefully we can use this for energy now oh, I didn't put protein now protein metabolism it it's kind of a little it's kind of strange it increases protein synthesis but it also increases protein degradation overall it tends to have what we said referred to as a net catabolic effect but we're not going to really talk about that too much so we may in, in lecture be able to address it a little bit but we're going to mainly talk about lipid metabolism and carbohydrate metabolism now what is the effects on the cardiovascular system so one of the things it does is it increases your blood flow and cardiac output now cardiac output this is the abbreviation for cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume so what it does is it increases heart rate because it increases the number of beta 1 adrenergic receptors in the heart and the response of these to norepinephrine and epinephrine is to increase heart rate so it's more of an indirect effect is by increasing the number of adrenergic receptors on the heart it makes it more sensitive to sympathetic nervous system stimulation so it has permissive 
effects. It increases cardiac contractility, so how forceful the heart contracts. And it does it again by increasing those numbers of beta-1 adrenergic receptors. If you increase cardiac contractility, that increases stroke volume, which is the volume of blood being pumped out of the heart. Now, so collectively, that would increase your cardiac output. So I want you to think about it. When you increase cardiac output, you're going to be able to deliver more blood to the tissues. You'll be able to deliver more oxygen, transport more carbon dioxide back from the working tissues. So you think your metabolism's up, you're going to need more oxygen. You'll be generating more carbon dioxide, so you want your cardiac output to go up. Another thing that we'll be able to address a lot more when we do cardiovascular system is looking at mean arterial pressure. That's what MAP stands for, is your mean arterial pressure or blood pressure. Mean arterial pressure stays normal, but pulse pressure increases. So just write that down now. We'll discuss it more during class. Now, respiration. Why don't you think about what would happen with respiration? Your oxygen consumption goes up. Your generation of carbon dioxide goes up. What do you want to happen to respiration? So think about it. You're going to want to increase respiration. So, so far we're seeing effects on overall metabolism of cells, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system. What are some of the other effects? Well, the gastrointestinal tract, that's your GI tract. It increases movements and secretions overall of your GI tract. So if you think of it that way, what are some of the signs and symptoms of someone who does not produce sufficient amounts of thyroid hormones? They're hypothyroid. So if you don't have sufficient levels of that, these guys are going to have decreased secretions and motility. They're going to have constipation. People who are hyperthyroid will have bouts of diarrhea because motility increases and GI secretions increase. Also, thyroid hormones affect the central nervous system. It affects normal development of the central nervous system. It also affects your mental state, we call cerebrations, which is just the thinking. That's what it is. It has to do with putting two, to, two and two together, your thinking. So overall increases cerebrations. So if you're hypothyroid, you kind of tend to be mentally sluggish. If you're hyperthyroid, you're going to tend to be like, um, what's another word for, instead of sluggish, you have uh, anxiety. So you're just always thinking. You can't, you can't just turn it off. This may have people with hyperthyroidism, because of that, may also have problems sleeping because they can't turn off their brain. Oops, sorry. Now, other things that um, the thyroid hormones do is it increases red blood cell production because, again, if your oxygen consumption goes up, you're going to need more red blood cells to carry the oxygen. So T3 and T4 has a large number of effects. Now, another one that I didn't have right here is it affects, I'll just put it on the next one, it affects growth. So maturation and growth. You just need it for normal growth, but if there's too much, it could be catabolic. And so it can affect bone growth. So it is needed for normal bone growth, but too much, you can end up having net breakdown of the bone. Central nervous system, besides what I showed you earlier, it's involved in maturation. So children, or a mother's pregnant and there's too little uh, thyroid hormones, the children can be born with something called cretinism. So they're going to have musculoskeletal defects as well as um, effects in which they're, they're going to have um, problems with retardation and things like that. So these are just some of the effects that thyroid hormones have. So this is the end of the recording on the effects of thyroid hormones, the regulation, and the mode of action.